okay, it's, it's going. Welcome everyone. This is the February 24th already um, meeting of the Joint Capital Planning Committee. And what I wanna do, um, I see that we have a quorum and I wanna make sure members of the committee can hear and be heard. And then after I finish that, I will ask for a volunteer for minutes um, to take minutes this evening. So I'm just going to call out first the members' names. Anna. Present. Farah. Here. Jennifer. Present. Mandy. Present. And Irv. Present. Um, as Mandy, you came in late, but Alex is not going to be joining us tonight. So, so we we have a quorum. So the meeting is officially started, and I just am going to ask for a volunteer for minutes. And it looks like you only have to volunteer once, given the number of weeks we're meeting. Okay, Jennifer, I'll do it. And we'll Jennifer, next, next time, Kathy. Okay, and Jennifer, we'll send you right after this a link to the video and also the last minute. So you can just use that form and then create, okay. update it with, you can know. I, the, I should know this, lesson. but can I download the last minutes from somewhere <laughs> right now? Yeah, so well, I can I'll, send I'll send you the last minutes as a Word document. So you can just use that and write over it. Wait, well, you're, gonna send, you're gonna send it to me now? I will send it to you after this meeting. But see, don't I need to have it now up before I start taking the notes? You know what I mean? I can send her the template. Are you, are you just looking for the template, Jennifer? Yes. That would be great. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, I can email you the template. Okay, okay. okay that's done. Um, so, so, Sean, sorry. Go, go on, Anna. If I, can I prep in advance? Can you send it to me if I'm going to do it for next time? Thank you. And um, I will also send you a copy in Word because it shows you just how we, or it's already got all of our names in it. It, it saves you some time. So, so with that said, I think Sean, you know the order that we're doing this evening, and I see we have our guests who are here tonight um, to talk about the capital projects that have been proposed. So why don't I let you take over the meeting at this point? Sure. So we're going to start with finance and human resources. Um, so the first one will be um, the uh, from our assessor, Kimberly Mew. And she's going to speak to the um, project on the, I think it's the cyclical evaluation, which is listed there. So Kim, do you want to start? Um, and just a reminder, the format will be uh, department heads will give sort of a brief overview of the project and then um, open it up to questions and we'll go from there. So Kim, do you want to start with um, your project? Sure. So hello, everyone. Um, so I have the cyclical and revaluation um, project that we have put in for, um, and basically what it is, is a state mandated uh, program where the revaluation, the state comes in, um, every community in the state of Massachusetts has this and it reoccurs every five years. Um, so basically what I am asking for is um, the extra funds to be able to complete this program, have the state um, have the state come in and, and go through our, our work, help us do the um, inspections that need to be done. Um, and then with the cyclical program, we have um, every 10 years, which is state mandated. And that is that we do inspections of at least 10% of our town every 10 years. Um, generally, just to keep the data fresh and current, most assessors like to try to do that within the, the last um, 10, uh, excuse me, the last five or the last three years, depending on the size of their town. If it's a really small town, they'd want to, you know, push it back to the two years. But um, so we want to try to get that jumped ahead of the game so that we can uh, have current data for this cyclical program. So um, I'll open it up for questions um, of Kim. Sorry for my little guest. <laughs> uh, I see Irv's hand is up, Irv. Yes, Kim, uh, would you specifically just give us a two minute overview of what you actually do in the cycl cyclical review? What do you do? What do you ask? Yeah. 
Yeah. So what we're doing is, so every single property in every single town and city throughout the state of Massachusetts has a 10 year, uh, 10 year period. And each and every property is different. So the, the, minute that I or one of our inspectors um, goes into the property, it starts the 10 year calendar. So basically what we're doing is we're taking our record card, which we have in our camera system, which is also available online. And we're just going through properties and verifying that our information is correct. Um, for example, we're looking at the style of the home. We're looking at the condition of the home down to the kitchen, the bathroom, um, you know, so on and so forth. We're looking to see, for example, do they have asphalt shingles versus maybe slate? We're looking to see is it vinyl siding versus maybe wood siding? Um, you know, those types of things. Just making sure that our data is accurate. Um, so every 10 years, the, the, the state comes in and, and expects that we have done at least 10% of our properties in town. Um, and so they come out and they will they will do a um, verification of that through a process of, of things. Um, does that does that help with what we're doing when we do the inspection, sir? Oh, it's uh, in incredibly clear uh, as to what you are doing. And um, uh, I, I think just for my own edification, it would be really good for us to review what exactly capital is as defined. Uh, and so we can, so we can have some guide here, Sean. If you can just read that little caption in terms of what capital is, capital projects are. Yeah. So, so I think this one is similar. I think this one and the next one are the two that kind of fall into that category um, of maybe not attached to a physical structure. I will say this one in particular is one that has it's it's happened in the past this isn't the first time it's been brought forward it's um it's a this is a repeat request that's every so many years it's requested but the reading the current capital definition um so i think from project eligibility it does talk about it being tangible assets or related to planning and or design work or tangible assets or related planning or and or design work. So I think these two maybe don't fall into that definition um, as well. I will say one of the reasons why we bring them here is because we could add them into the operating budget, but you'd be adding it for one year and then taking it out the next year. And then a few years later, you have to add it back in and take it out. Um, it's not something, and, and when it's in the operating budget, the amount doesn't carry over. So you, if you don't use it that year, you lose it. And so these are things where they're tough to put in the operating budget because the flow of how we use the money is not the same as other operation operations. These are sort of large one-time contracts that hold us over for several years. And then we come back when, once it's been fully, um, the funds have been fully used and we need to do the next evaluation, they come back up. Um, same thing with the next one that you're going to hear about the HR study. That's not a recurring thing. We could add it to the operating budget, but then that means we're we're looking at other areas to reduce in order to add that to the operating budget for one year. Um, and it just seems like those types of things fit better in capital, which are these one-time projects that then you don't we don't have to fund them again the next year. Um, Mandy. Thanks. We have our definition of capital that we're not necessarily sure this falls into, but would we be running into any state issues, you know, or state definitions or requirements regarding capital expenditures versus operating expenditures, if we funded these things under capital, like, I don't think so. In terms of the amounts, their capital, they're, you know, they're large um, amounts and single contracts that we would go out and procure. Um, so I think it's really up to us in terms of how we want to define it. And I guess I what I hear or raised this last time too, Sean. I mean, Paul is listening in, but it may be in the process that we're governing ourselves under. We need to relook at the, that definition and figure out how this is, because this is, as I understand it, you're you're paying inspectors to go out. It's it's no. It's, so this one, yeah, yeah. Sorry, if it wasn't clear. So this one would be. This is to um, contract. There's there's several um, appraisal companies out there. Um, that have staff and sort of teams of appraisers that can address large amounts of um, properties at once. Um, and so 
every town usually has at least one contract with one of these firms to provide that sort of support um, for these periodic uh, updates. So this would be a contract with a, a, an outside firm to do this. So Irv, your, your hand is still up, but I think what you're, yeah. you're, you're asking is that we don't have a definition that seems to fit this. And so- Well, well yeah. more, more, more than that, it, it's, you know, I'm not a fan of moving uh, from one part of the budget, which would, uh, for instance, the operating budget of the town and putting it into the capital budget um, when there's a financial need in one section, one, one part of the budget. And it assumes that there is no room or other areas of programs that could be funded in another part of the budget. So what I want, what I'm wanting to do is to say, hey, look, let's, let's make a line here on this, because this is something that's going to continue to happen over and over again. Uh, if you're going to balance the budget, uh, uh, the, the operating budget, uh, uh, as a result of putting a cost that would more normally re be in the operating budget, you're putting it in the capital budget, then make that statement. Say, hey, we're hurting over here in the operating budget and we really uh, would need some help by putting this over in the capital budget. And that seems to me what is happening. Yeah, I, I think in these particular cases, um, there's a history of it, or in this particular case, there's a history of this specific activity being funded out of capital. Um, but I do hear what you're saying, and I think Kathy, your point is a good one, which is we should review that definition and see if um, if that's what we want to stay with, or if we want to consider modifications to it. So I think we should move to the next project because, and and then since we raised that question, focus on questions about the project itself, if that's okay with everyone. Yeah, because yeah, that, that'll apply for the next project as well. So any and final other... questions on, um, sorry, go ahead, Kathy. No, go ahead. I just want to- Any final questions on uh, the cyclical evaluation project? Again, this will be a, this would be a, an amount to hire a contractor to support the assessor's office and their, their um, the update of all the properties that they have to work on, which has been, and, and this, um, Kim, Kim can speak to it a little bit. It's a little bit of a unique time too because of the pandemic. Um, the way we get access properties and do updates of properties has been, that's one area of um, the finance office that's been impacted the most. So I don't see any other hands. So Kim, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. joining us. And Sorry uh, about my little guest. <laughs> no, and, no and, we, and we'll see whether any of our houses fall into your 10%, you know. So <laughs> thank yes. you. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. So the next one is uh, from our HR director, Donna Ray Keneally. She's going to speak to the um, compensation study. All right. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for hearing about this request. Um, this, my request was, was for a compensation study. And the major goal of this project would be to develop, support, and maintain a fair and equitable classification and compensation system for Amherst municipal positions. And um, the study would include a variety of departments and divisions. And I think um, primarily non-union, DPW, supervisor, and professional positions. Um, there could be some analysis um, related to pay equity throughout the town for other positions that might be covered under a collective bargaining agreement. Um, but ultimately, the last study was done in 2013, so it's been nearly a decade, and I think it might be the right time to review once again. Um, the town has a stated compensation philosophy um, that the personnel board um, worked on and put forward, and, and essentially it's um, stating to ensure that the overall compensation structure is at the 75th percentile when compared to other selected comparable communities and um I, i'm just not sure if we're we're um, reaching that stated goal we might be we might be exceeding it um but it would be nice to have a study to help us through that um to make sure we're in line all these the studies really help f to control costs that they help to make sure that we are ensuring internal equity which is 
not only the right thing to do, but it's the law. Um, and it helps us very importantly to attract and motivate and retain our talent. And you know, our employees are really important here for the, the work that we're doing, of course. So that is why I've put forward the request. And does anyone have any questions? Questions? Mandy. Um, just two. Um, the first one is, it says here it's for all departments. Is that just all town departments or does that include the school and library departments too? And the second one is, does a compensation study also detail um, like size of departments, like number of staff for a town our size, things like that, or is it really just about pay? So they, I mean, so it could include that. And this, I have to say, maybe I was, wasn't, wasn't as thoughtful as I should have been when describing the project. Um, so I was thinking of town, not schools, and also um, really non-union positions for the most part. However, because of pay equity, I do want to look at certain union positions when there's um, non-union uh, positions that are similar to just make sure that we're, um, that we have pay equity in the town. And what was this other question? Did I whether it looks at the number of employees and departments and benchmarks that way too, or just actual compensation? That's a great question. And I think it would do, it, when I put out the request for, for bids, I can put it out both ways and then just try to see what we get back for, you know, I think that's a great idea and it makes a lot of sense. That would just add a little bit of cost to it. So um, I, when I put the bid out, if, if approved, then I will make sure that I ask for that as well and adding to that um this one i think the, the primary goal is the compensation levels to see how competitive our compensation levels are to other communities related to the position we have in the past had separate staffing studies and sonia maybe you can speak to that we we have recently had a staffing study that looked more at like the positions and the um types of positions uh within certain departments yeah, we've had, we've had some small scale ones actually. Donna could probably speak better to that than I can. But I, I just want to bring up, there isn't a specific category for these studies in the capital plan. We, we used to have three major um, buckets that we put things in, equipment, buildings, and facilities. And I know buildings and facilities should be the same thing, but they're not. And under facilities is where we would put like, ADA studies, master plan updates, discover list and price all personal property, review and list real estate at UMass, flood mapping revisions. We've always had these studies in the capital plan because they are pretty much a one-time thing that straddle more than one fiscal year. So it's not, this isn't new. So Anna, Anna's hand is up. That's true. Uh, Mandy asked one of my questions. So my other question is, you know, we heard the last one was done in 2013. How often do you anticipate returning with these types of studies or this type of study, specifically a compensation study? I mean, I, I would hope that it would be another decade until we had to do another one if, you know, okay. because we, we have the ability in human resources, of course, as a single position comes up to review and rate and we have the knowledge, skills and abilities for for those one-offs that come up. So I wouldn't think it would be for a number of years. Okay. And then my second part is, you know, I think one of the things that bothers not just me, and this is not, I haven't seen this from Amherst, but is when people do these really great, amazing studies and then they know the answer, but where's the action? So I'm curious if this is part of a larger strategic initiative or what you plan on doing based on the results. And I understand that you may not be able to know exactly because you don't have them, but I'm I'm just curious what next steps would be after the um, study is done. That's a, that's an excellent question. And so, and I just wanna be clear that this study would not be trying to recommend any reductions in pay or benefits right. or take any positions away. This is to make sure our compensation is in line. Um, and then of course, if we find out that we're out of line, I'll be knocking on Sean and Sonia's door asking for them to fix a, a problem. And, you know, so that's, I would imagine that's what the result would be if we do find some issues of um, that need repair. Okay, thank you. Curve. 
Uh, oh, first is a question. Does the assessor's office have any kind of budget? We're, we're, this is this is an HR now, Irv. Are you back at the assessor? No, I'm asking the question. Does the assessor's office? Yeah, they have a. Yep, they have a. Um, they have a departmental budget. Right. So why isn't this property evaluation under that assessor's budget? Yeah, so they do have a budget for a much smaller sort of annual need type budget for this type of thing. I think this one, again, because it's a every five year, every 10 year type of activity, it's not in their year to year budget because they don't need it every single year. Uh, you know, Sean, you and I really appreciate you saying that, but but there, you know, you know, differential cash flows are always in, in order. And you know, and I know that. Uh, at any year that this is coming up, you can put it in a budget, like we're putting it in a budget now. When it comes up another time, I know in terms of consistency, Sean, you would like to see it just flow like that. But in terms of where it would fit, uh, in my mind, is that hey, if the assessor's office is part of, has a property as part of it, especially property evaluations and reevaluations uh, re and assessments, that that would more more normally fall under that budget. So I don't understand why it's here. And in yeah, terms yeah. Of, uh, you know, so and that's one question. But in, in terms of facilities, uh, in terms of HR, I mean, it's just a huge stretch for me how HR could fall under facilities or any other area that's not uh, that's related to capital. Yeah, I mean, I think in both cases, if we had sort of unlimited flexibility to budget these in the operating budget each year and not necessarily need to or not necessarily spend them we would i think the fact is we you know if we budgeted these each year they wouldn't be spent they would be there and we'd have to figure out where they would go but these don't the reason why we want capital is because it carries over from one year to the next so if we set a certain amount aside it, it's uneven in how it's spent and but it's designated for that specific purpose again if it was in the operating budget it these types of projects that we would have to figure out how to get it all done within that year or, or something. I'm not sure how we would do it. Again, these have been in capital in the past. Um, and the reason is because they're distinct projects that are not every year, they're expensive. Um, and they, they really don't fit in the operating side because they're not an annual operating expense. But I, and again, I hear what you're saying. It's hard to, I mean, I, I get that it doesn't fit nicely into the definition of capital. So um, we'll certainly take a look at it, but it, I just don't see how we would put it into the operating budget either. Um, I think from a organization standpoint and sort of what makes the most sense and what's most practical, it, it fits more um, in line with capital and, and the way capital is spent. Uh. Um, Don, I you, you said the last such evaluation was done in 2013. I just speaking to Anna's point. So what kind of action was taken then? Well, it looks like, so what I could find, I found a file on it. I wasn't here at the time, but I found a file and it looked like what they, they made some recommendations and it looks like some, some, the scale was adjusted up mm -hmm. in, in, Many instances, the scale was adjusted up anywhere between 0.07% to, I think the highest one I noticed was uh, maybe a 6%. Um, don't, don't quote me on that because I don't have that right in front of me. But so I do know that there were some adjustments made and they the report they offered um, that I was looking through was really detailed in terms of the other towns that they looked at, the, the um, the functions of the of the positions to make sure that you're comparing kind of apples to apples, oranges to oranges, um, and uh, and then they made their recommendations, and then we we either took them or, or we didn't. It looks like, but it does look like ultimately the scale was updated to reflect some of the changes uh, recommendations. Thank you. Thanks. So. Uh, I don't see any other hands. I just have a quick question. When you say comparables, do we have a set of towns, municipalities that we look at? And does, so would that be the same in 2013 and now? Um, so I don't know whether how far to the east we go or how far to the west of Massachusetts we go. Um, so Mandy asked the scope of employees, but are we looking at 
municipalities that are at least as big as Amherst. Um, so it, it's just a question of how do we choose our bench benchmarking communities? And I think that'll definitely be something that I'll be looking for the consultant to recommend to us. But what I'll provide is what we've used in the past. But I would also want their opinion. Are we comparing the right communities? Are we, um, you, you know, right, our wages are not in the same as Boston. And so we shouldn't be looking necessarily that way. But the town of Amherst is not you know, um, I, t I don't want to name any other town, but, you know, we have a lot of different things that we do that maybe other towns don't do. So we want to find like communities and, and the right comparables. So I think I'd be even looking. So I would say, here's what we've done in the past. Do you think this still works for us? And I would hope that they would give us their thoughts on that. Yep. And I'd probably get some guidance from um, Paul, too. Yep, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, I, Farrar, is your hand still up from before, or did you? Okay, I think I think I'm looking across. I don't. I think that ends the questions. Well, thank you all for your time. Thanks, Tanaray. Right, thank thank you. you. Bye. So the next department is school technology and. Jerry is joining us. He's very mad at me for scheduling this on April vacation week, um, but he's joined us from somewhere tropical is my guess. Yeah, that's not my spare room behind me at all. So, um, so yeah, uh, good evening. Thank you for having me. So um, let me see, just switch screens real quick. So yeah, presenting uh, this year's request, it was modified slightly from what I submitted last year based on kind of the events over the last two years, which included um, the um, ESSER funds and other different COVID related funds that were applied to equipment purchases um, during uh, the remote learning, which then those devices were retained and spill over now into our um, you know, in-person learning. So uh, there's really just two broad categories, which are the technology infrastructure categories and then the, the quote unquote multimedia equipment. So the larger by far is the uh, technology infrastructure categories, and that's broken down into many subcategories. But this year, um, I've kind of distilled it down into four critical areas that we're looking to um, replace the equipment. Uh, the, the largest is the computer laptop tablet replacements, which we have a number of uh, devices, uh, most specifically uh, teacher laptops that are aging and failing at an increasing rate. Um, the, the majority of the laptops out there now are um, a, a Lenovo Model T450, which dates back to um, January of 2015 when they were initially released. Seven years for a laptop is, is quite something. Um, and when we bought those, we got them off lease at the time. So they weren't brand new when we got them, but, and they've served us well, but now they're starting, we're starting to see some attrition in those devices. Um, one of the problems we've had this year, and I'm sure a lot of people have, are supply chain issues, especially as related to technology equipment. I could not find new laptops that were comparable to the equipment we've been purchasing in the past, or either major manufacturers, specifically Lenovo or Dell, which we were having trouble buying. So. We're keeping going what we have for now. And when supplies have improved, we'll hopefully be replacing the, the devices then. The other big item on there is projectors. Um, every classroom has a digital projector. The majority that we have now are this one model that we bought, I think, about eight years ago now that were uh, Epson 460s, uh, those had problems initially. The company extended the warranty quite a bit, but we saw a lot of failures at the beginning of this year. They were sitting idle for a year, 
when we were remote, they came back, we used a couple months and then sitting again. When we started back in September, we saw quite a few die and we could not get re projector replacements. I just received projectors two weeks ago that I had ordered in September, and that was only 10 of them. We backfilled with some large screen TVs, a couple of people opted for um, interactive flat panels, but most teachers don't like the large screen TVs because they have to give up their whiteboards for that. And, and that doesn't work well with the way they teach. So we're looking to start replacing these older T460 models over the next couple of years. I have 44 of those in service currently, or a few less now because we've replaced them. So replacing them with newer laser projectors, which means they don't have recurring costs of projection lamps that run about $1,800 each. So we're looking at 79,000 over the next few years. So I've split that out over a couple of years here. We are also looking to upgrade our wireless network, which has been in place for a few years now. I have equipment that I ordered in September and I haven't received yet. And maybe I think March they said, but there's no bet on that. So, and it's other manufacturers are experiencing the same uh, supply issues. I'm ordering Ruckus, HP Aruba is having issues and, and others as well on some of my listservs and message boards. It's just a common thread that oh, we're still waiting for parts and stuff. So that is the switch line, which supports the wireless access points and then the wireless access points line. So we likely still have monies left over that we haven't spent yet because I can't get the items. So the lower figure for this year reflects just kind of the, the, the remainder that we have to uh, procure. So that brings us down to about $190,000 based on estimated prices when I created this. Um, the last two lines are multimedia, replacing worn dead, which you don't know that up front, and then um, document cameras. There's not really much demand for interactive whiteboards anymore, but these are just some of the other pieces. I've been able to find some document cameras that are less expensive than we were putting in. So this number could probably be lowered over time. So that's it for the items for this year. Do you have any questions? Questions from the committee? Mandy. Yes, a couple of questions. Um, uh, we're in the middle of a building project right now that um, is going to relate to the elementary schools and get rid of one school, hopefully. Um, that's what the building committee will recommend um, so that we consolidate into a 575 student school and have two remaining schools as of 2026, which is part of this five-year plan. So um, are you ensuring that as you purchase these um, new projectors and stuff that you're not purchasing more than there will be classroom space for come 2026? Um, and what, and the next question is regarding the wireless upgrades. Are you looking at upgrading wireless for schools that we're going to be mothballing soon? And if so, um, what considerations regarding that project have gone into that potential need for upgrades? And then the final question is, this is over, a the five-year plan has over a million dollars in school IT um, technology in the next five years. Uh, that's a lot. What are we doing with the old technology that is being um, replaced to um, get back some of that money. And um, because it sounds like the TVs at least and some of these other things might actually be usable and saleable. What what are we doing to ensure that um, we're getting, you know, sort of as much money as we can from old technology since it seems like there's a whole lot being replaced year in and year out. Okay, um, three questions. Um, you can remind me if I forget one part. So, um, the building project, you're, you're estimating 2026, or the estimate right now is that it's re available or ready. Uh, I would guess you're talking uh, for um, fall of 26. That's still four years down. And technology 
typically you get about a five year lifespan for a lot of the technology out here. Um, we tend to extend it much further. We extend it as far as we can. As I said, the laptops I'm looking to replace this year were first released in January of 2015 and they were purchased around that time frame. So those are going seven years old. The projectors we're looking to replace now are much older. Okay. Five years into the technology world is a long time to predict what the um, what the technology at the moment or the, the new technology that's available will be at that time. Based on what teachers are using now and what their demands are and what we purchased in the past and what they've decided they don't want, I, I still see projectors being used. I don't know that we're going to reduce the number of classrooms significantly. Okay, even with the larger uh, 575 school. As a matter of fact, this year I've had to create a lot of extra classrooms due to the, um, the reduction of the quads to duplexes at Wildwood Fort River. Those students in those classes had to go elsewhere. So we were pressing rooms that were used for other things into service that needed projectors or large screen TVs. I've had to put TVs, the, because there are no real walls to mount projectors in, in the cafeterias at Wildwood and Fort River, for example. So that's a good one. There was some um, ELL rooms that um, were placed into service as classrooms this year that did not have projectors before. They didn't want them and didn't need them. So I had to get, I initially got a TV for that because that's all I could get, and the teacher hated it. I finally got a projector and we put a projector in uh, about two weeks ago and moved that TV to another cafeteria that they needed a device. So everything that we have right now is being reused. The projectors we're taking out of service are dead. That's why they're being removed from service. We're not just upgrading them, just to upgrade them. Um, they've either had uh, significant failures or in the, um, the what's called the light engine or the, the optics or one of those things. So we don't replace projectors just because they're getting old. We replace them because they failed. And a lot of the projectors, all of the projectors we're replacing are the older um, four to three ratio, kind of like your old CRT TVs. So the projectors are coming in our new widescreen, which reflects the the laptop screen so you get a better quality picture. They're also much brighter, which allows the teachers to not have to shut all the lights off in the classroom um, in order to project. So, so that's um, the thing about the projectors. Um, the other question is about the technology. When we replace Chromebooks, for example, they are end of life. So Google has a set window for upgrading Chromebooks. You, you're, given updates for five to six years, depending on when it's released. After that time, no more updates, which doesn't sound like a big deal. You say no more updates. However, certain programs we run, like the DRC um, ins uh, Insight Testing application or the uh, TestNav application for the MCAS, requires Chrome of a specific, specific version and up. If you don't have that, it won't run. So that's why we replace the Chromebooks at a regular basis. Unfortunately, because they're end of update, they have very little residual value. We actually have, I think, upwards of a thousand Chromebooks right now that we're cataloging. Any of those that surplus equipment is placed on this surplus equipment list. Um, ben Harrington's actually been kind of overseeing that process. We give him a list, he places it on the surplus equipment list, and people bid on that. So we get whatever residual monies we can get. If it's region, it goes to the E&D fund. If it's Amherst, it goes back to the town. That doesn't go back to the school system at all. Okay. You know, it indirectly does over time, but not directly. So that's what happens with the old equipment. We can't just sell it on the, on the uh, you know, private market because that's not what the, the state law uh, requires as far as my understanding goes. Um, as far as the wireless goes, Again, we're talking four to five years for the new school. Um, I don't see a problem if the technology is still current, which hopefully it will be, but I can't guarantee that of removing, you know, the wireless access points from the ceilings or wherever and mounting them in the new school without having 
final plans yet, we don't know what we're going to need in the new school. Um, one of the things I've seen this year in all the schools, not just the elementary, but more so at the secondary level, is because every student now has a device. Okay, at the elementary, they don't bring them home, but every student has a device, even kindergarten. We have enough iPads for every student in every classroom. So the number of devices has exploded. This year, we have also seen the demand that, uh, not a demand, but the, the request by paras to have Chromebooks available to them because we pulled a lot of desktops out of service once we started adding these Chromebooks for all the students. So the number of desktops has gone down, but now we see paras requesting Chromebooks because they needed a device to be able to work on, to be able to work on with their students and for other reasons, excuse me just a second. So we've seen an increase in devices. So now we have all these wireless devices accessing these wireless access points. And to support that, we've had to add some access points as well. So we've only seen an increase in demand for the wireless system over the year. Um, we never envisioned, excuse me, <clears throat> the cafeterias would be used as classrooms. We had to add access points to cover the cafeterias, for example. So we've increased the number of access points. And I believe the new building is going to be at least two stories. So now I have to worry about covering coverage over the two full stories, as well as whether whatever common and ancillary spaces we have. So without final plans for the building, I can't say how well the equipment we're going to be buying this year, if it ever becomes available in next, are going to cover that. But it, whatever we have may be available, but I can't predict that with any certainty. And I'll just add quickly, um, Mandy, I think that is a really good question that we can raise at our next building, uh, <laughs> Kathy and I can bring to our next building committee meeting, is how does that work? I mean, there's no project approved at this point, so I think it's it's hard to make any actions at this point, but it, it coming hopefully coming soon, there will be. Um, and and how does how is that looked in other communities where one school is closed? What type of, you know, I know there's is a budget within the project for buying furnishings and technology, um, but how much can be brought over from the existing schools if it's in good shape? So Kathy and I can bring that question back because um, I think that is a good one we should start thinking about. Other questions, Irv? Um, the other day I had the um, good fortune to uh, virtually go through a school that I, when I was a founding teacher at. And they were looking at uh, on the new technology that was uh, in place there. And one of the most remarkable things was the role now of virtual reality in classroom instruction and how phenomenal uh, it is. It, it, is a, it is a disruptor. It is something that is, if we do not plan for in our future buildings, uh, we will be um, shortchanging our kids. Uh, the technology is leapfrogging every two years and doubling in its capacity. And if people do not know what I mean by virtual reality, I would, would really invite you to just go on Google or anything else and check it out because it is a major force and will be a major force um, in education and in, in, in the times coming. So I, Jerry, I understand your, your dilemma and also your planning abilities for looking at the new building. And I certainly sympathize with you. And uh, I think this, this panel here needs to understand that when this new, uh, in terms of this new building, that there are technologies that are now in play that will be even more sophisticated before uh, this building is even built. Other questions or comments? Um, I have just one, um, Jerry, when you, the, the piece of paper we have to review has one figure 
on it, Sean, and you seem to be reading off a list of so many of this and so many of that. So when the capital budget, if this amount goes through, are you fair, left fairly flexible on it turns out you're spending more on the IT access points, less on the Chromebooks or more on the this or more, how does it work? Because we're looking at a, a, a collected amount of money rather than line items. So I'm, it's just sort of a, a, a question of your own flexibility because as you said, supply chains are coming in. So you may get some things in and not other things. Does this leave you flexible? Yes. Yeah, I, I have always been flexible. I've always been, and I think if you look at kind of the history of how I've spent and not always spending it all in the year that I requested it, has been flexible. I, I tend to try to find the best value I can and the best prices. So when I predict the price, that's based on the going price when I put the, the request together. But when time comes and I put the different vendors against each other to get quotes, then it, then it may change. So I may be able to save money here and there. Um, so so it, it's always in flux. Technology, equipment, and pricing is always in flux. It's not as bad as cars right now, but the prices have gone up over the, the past year, unfortunately, because of supply and demand. So, and, and I'd like to address one more time um, Mandy's question about moving the technology over. I, with a new building, I think you'll be surprised at how the technology is going to change just in the building itself. Um, I live in East Hampton. We're just almost done comp building our K to eight school. Everything in that building that can be controlled runs over the network. So the lights, the speakers, the P, you know, the, the entire PA system, the clocks, everything runs over the network. So when you say, okay, this is what we have in the existing building you're gonna find that's gonna be wholly inadequate when looking at a new school. Are we gonna put security cameras in the new school? Well, those run over the network. We have them at the secondary, but not at the elementary now. So going forward, you're gonna see a, a, a market increase in the technology level of the school. So. Thank you. All right, do you want me to go to the next? Um, thank you so much, Jerry. I, I um, think so, yes. Okay. So Sean Hannon is up next for uh, Town IT. Thanks. Um, mine, it's pretty simple this year. Um, got the, the biggest part is the infrastructure improvements, which is similar to what Jerry ha uh, experienced as we pared that down this year. Um, we. Fortunately, we're able to buy a fair number of laptops and some other equipment early on um, with CARES money and other money. And so we pared that down to $75,000 for primarily for PCs and wireless access points. Um, we typically have a server in there. We were able to remove that. We've got $10,000, which is under other department requests that um, this year is specifically for um, computer workstations for the communication center for the dispatchers and the police department. Those run 24 seven. And so we, we don't wait for those to fail to replace them. So we replace them um, of, a, of all the computers in town. We replace, replace them the most often. They tend to be more expensive because they're um, a little beefier. And then we have the library, um, which is $42,000. Um, that's for wireless access points, computers, um, a photocopier. Um, that's, what, that's what goes into that. So uh, that's all I have to say about it. Questions? Mandy. Basically my same too, Sean. Um, sure. 
what do we do with all of our old tech? Um, do we, you know, and then, cause there's a lot every year, right? If we're spending 650 to a million dollars every five years on tech, there's a lot of old tech. And then for the library equipment, um, wireless access points and all, do you foresee them being able to be used in the new building or what, what, what's that planning process going on now that we're actually approved and moving towards building and renovating and expanding the Jones library? Yeah, so for the first question, we, um, similar to what Jerry was saying, by the time we're done with um, technology, it, it's pretty banged up and um, it, it, it's lost most of its value, but we are working with procurement. So we just, um, through accounting, we just um, are getting ready to wrap up our, a major phone upgrade. And so we have 300 plus phone handsets that are, 12 to 15 years old, but um, because their phones, are, there's there's going to be some value, so they will go out to um, through the through account, and they'll go out to essentially an auction site. Um, so we'll try and recoup recoup what we can, and if we get five bucks a phone out of it, then it's you know it's something. Um, so essentially, they go out to an auction site, so we get you know hopefully get market value for it, and so. We'll, We'll continue to do that annually with any equipment, just kind of stockpile it and get rid of, get rid of it all at once. As far as the library, um, we coordinate that with um, library staff, so we will um, we will likely wait to purchase the computers until um, they'll they'll be in a temporary location and and figure out if it makes sense to buy computers from when they move in there or when they move back, and then also coordinate with, with them what um, what of the technology can be um, purchased with MBLC money. Um, my recollection from 15 years ago working in Worcester is the essentially the network equipment was included in that and the computers were not. So we'll make sure that we only buy stuff that um, essentially we need to pay for rather than what could be paid for with MBLC money. Uh, Anna. Uh, two questions. The first is looking out at the project, uh, project, sorry, not pro, oh my God, it's not even 9 p.m. Project cost <laughs> summary. Uh, it jumps significantly in fiscal year 24 and then to 25, and then it stays pretty consistent. Can you explain why this year is so much lower than those years? Um, I'm not asking you to add more, to be clear. I'm just curious why. <laughs> uh, and then the other question I have is, you know, this says replacements of PCs and things like that. Um, and I'm curious if there was consideration given for this changing work world and the need for folks to be able to work from home and remotely and how that shifted your um, your ask here. If yeah. So, yeah. So as far as as far as why you see the the changes year to year, we we have different replacement cycles that things are on. And so where you see the big jump um, for FY24 is when we expect to have to replace some of the servers in our in our data center. So that's um, and some of the networking equipment. And that's why that's why you see that. We also in an effort to keep this um, this year a little bit leaner, we shifted a little bit out to next year. So that's why that's why you see that. And we luckily, or fortunately, this year, we're we're seeing some of the benefits of the CARES money paying for um, a lot of equipment. So, um, which kind of leads into the work from home. Uh, early on during the pandemic, we purchased a large number of um, all-in-one workstations and laptops to send home with staff. Um, so they could work from home. And um, many of those who are the majority of them are back in the office now, so that a lot of them have have brought that equipment back in, and so it just it gets re um, kind of goes back into the pool and gets reused for other um, offices in town as we need it. Um, as far as anticipating more work from home, um, there's not. Uh, luckily, it's not a lot. There's not a lot of it uh, cost to equipment for that. Um, because we kind of, we, 
we tend to shift um, when we had people working from homes at home, they did not have a computer at work. And so we kind of had some flexibility in, in where the equipment was and, and we'd give them a laptop rather than a desktop and they could use that at home. Or um, we, are, we are looking as more and more um, of the software and services we use is in the cloud. We are looking at, you know, we, we get more flexibility with, you know, so many people work primarily in email and, and files now that they, it, for a lot of users, for some departments, it really doesn't matter whether they're on the town network or or just on public Wi-Fi somewhere. So that makes it easier as well as the, the phone system we, we've, moving, we've moved to gives us a lot of flexibility in where people um, use their phone. So um, we have staff who work from home and the the phone that they have on their desk at home is their 259, you know, their regular office number that they can just pick that up. And so when they call out, they're not calling out as their cell phone, they're calling out as, you know, their, their office number. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I think that does answer. I mean, the only other thing that comes to mind is just, are there anticipated infrastructure needs for um, continued hybrid meetings and things like that that um, are factored in here or may need to be factored in in the future. Yeah, so we we luckily addressed some of that in um, in one of the meeting rooms in in town hall, and the, quite frankly, it's more of a um, the hybrid meetings more of a an operating cost just in terms of staffing. Um, that makes sense. There, but there's. So luckily the, the AV costs of things, we, we, we had redone the town room right um, at the beginning of the new council. And so we, we were very fortunate and the, we had everything we needed to, to support hybrid meetings there. Um, so we, we certainly could do that in other, um, other rooms if we needed to. Thank you. Thanks. Sean. Sean, are you in the bathroom that you're redoing right now? <laughs> I was going to ask about bathroom laptops, but it seemed like not the appropriate thing. To do. <laughs> I just, while we were talking about redoing the bathroom, and I see this looks like a shower curtain. I was just checking. I mean, no, it is actually a shower curtain. No, it's a it's a little nook that my wife uh, we redid so that uh, she could have space that wasn't uh, okay. They're just invaded by kids. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But maybe next year. <laughs> so are there any other questions for Sean on town IT? I don't think so. I, I think it's quite remarkable what you've been able to do, Sean. So thank you, including thanks. It's including a, support luck. people that can't figure out how to make their their equipment work the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, we're very fortunate to have the, the funding that we get as well as the uh, the staff that we have. It makes it makes my life a lot easier. So my job a lot easier. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. So the next uh, department is the police department and Scott is here. Um, Gabe is also in the audience. I'll promote him if he wants to come in. Um, Scott, do you wanna exp uh, go over the cruiser purchase? Sure. Um, so yeah, my request is pretty straightforward and basic as well. It's for four replacement hybrid patrol vehicles, um, their SUV types, um, all wheel drive, and the total package of the request includes like the markings and everything that goes associated with it, the lights and all that stuff. So th that request um, amount is for everything included in each vehicle. So um, the cost has gone up significantly um, not just for vehicles, but for hybrid vehicles in particular. So um, it's even changed since we first put in the proposal um, originally. So, you know, we're trying to adapt to the what's going on in the in the nation and in the world when it comes to the cost of vehicles. So that's kind of where we are. And um, I'll entertain questions. Jennifer. Uh, Chief Livingstone, what, um, how old and in what condition are the vehicles that these are intended to replace? So typically um, the years 
for the patrol vehicles, they last about a year and a half to two years, and they all have at least 100,000 miles on them. In some cases, it's 120,000 to 140,000, but that 100,000 mile benchmark is about where we try to replace them because that's where the expensive items start breaking down. Things like transmissions and drivetrains and engines and brakes and that sort of thing. So, you know, to replace an engine, it's like $25,000. So, you know, um, it's typically two years, 100,000 miles. And I'll just say quickly, they are um, highlighted in the um, in the inventory. So for the most part, the ones that will be replaced, as, as uh, Chief Livingstone described, it will be over 100,000 or near 100,000. There are a couple that are slated for replacement that are just really old. Um, yeah. There's one that's from 1997 and um, doesn't quite have the, the high mileage, but it's in poor condition. Mandy. Yeah, a couple of questions. It looks like um, this year's um, plan is for the, is this the one for the extra car replacement, number one? Because um, I think there's always every so many years an extra car. Um, and second, costs have definitely gone up. Hopefully they'll come back down before you actually have to order these cars. But if not, what is the new cost? Like, is this 260 how much lower is that number than what the costs are right now? Like, what are we actually potentially looking at? The council's already dealt with some fire truck replacements and needing to add money to last year's or this fiscal year's appropriations for vehicles. So what would that new number be? Um, and should we be putting that into this request? And then I'm going to ask you, Scott, um, Chief, because there's no department on this list at this point, but the new Crest department, I know the plan initially was to buy some vehicles for that, and that's on a different sort of funding schedule, um, but, and maybe it's not for the chief, it's for Sean and Paul, um, will we get a capital program that includes the Crest department at some point and what the expected capital purchases over the next five years are for that. And then um, could some of these vehicles be transferred to that program if it's deemed that could be doable once the program that that department gets up and running and, and more information is obtained about staffing levels between the two departments. Scott, do you want to start? We, I can I can address the Crest question, um, if, okay. and if you want to weigh in, feel free. So yeah, I'll answer the first few questions, Mandy Joe. Um, so yes, this is a four four vehicle replacement year, and that happens every fourth year. Um, we used to get four vehicles every year, and we changed that. I think when I became chief, so ten years ago, we went to three, 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 and four, and um, it's worked. For the most part, it's worked, and um, and then the cost analysis is, we think we overestimated just a little bit, um, so we're hoping that. Uh, um, what a uh, Sean, what do we come in at sixty five per vehicle? Uh, yeah, yep. Yeah, so we're thinking it'll be around sixty to sixty two, and that'll outfit every vehicle. So we're hoping that there'll be money coming back on that end. Um, from what we're hearing from our supplier, that's the cost. And um, what was the third question? Oh, uh, replacement. So, you know, we typically, the ones that we're replacing get turned over and we get a small stipend from the, um, from the uh, supplier. It's typically in the average of $2,500 for a vehicle. It's not a lot, but again, that money goes back towards the general fund. So any money that we get for, for a turn-in vehicle uh, goes back to the town, but we've, I don't think we, re, I don't think we just like turn them over to other agencies anymore, or, or excuse me, other departments. We did that here and there and it didn't seem to pan out too well, so. And then um, the other area that if, if the 
vehicle came in more expensive because of the sustainability or the, the hybrid technology, we do have the sustainability pot of um, funds that we're proposing as well that we could um, consider. On the Crest front, so as you noted, that's sort of on a different timeline. We're looking to um, the funding for, for the vehicle purchases or the vehicle purchase for now for that program um, is either, either going to come from the DPH grant, the Department of Health grant that we uh, acquired last year, or from ARPA. Um, and so I know they're in the process right now of reviewing what types of vehicle, uh, what type, the type of vehicle that they would want. Um, and, and I think once they're once they settle on an option, we would look to how we would purchase it. Um, but the funding source would be, again, a sort of on a different cycle just because of the, the timing of how that department's coming together. In terms of um, future capital needs, if there are other capital needs identified, um, they will, there'll be a department that is created um, on this capital plan. I know there's going to probably be some technology. A lot of the, the upfront costs, again, are going to come from these, the grant grants that I described. Um, but in terms of ongoing regular capital, it will be part of the plan. And one other thing I would just add, because I think it's important, because I used to get asked a lot about hybrid vehicles, and um, you know we were we purchased those as soon as they were available. We have been notified by our suppliers, which is Ford and Chevy for the most part. Um, they anticipate us being able to have a electric patrol type vehicle within two to three years. So I've notified Sean and Stephanie that we need to start thinking about you know, substantial charging station purchases as well. So that's down the road. Anna. Hi, so I apologize if this is a redundant question. I was trying to find my inventory and there's too many tabs open in my life right now. So uh, are you looking at the, the list of the inventory? You've got four vehicles that, um, or sorry, you've got a couple of vehicles that are listed as poor. And I'm curious if this one of these SUVs is intended to replace the the Chevy Silverado truck um, that you had listed as in poor condition, or if you're only replacing vehicle for vehicle, like you're only replacing SUV for SUV. So we typically will replace just vehicle for vehicle. Um, you know, I wanted to replace a, a pickup truck with a plow attachment. Um, we typically plow our own facility. Okay, I was going to say, what do you use that for? <laughs> okay. Yeah. That, that and we it. also use it for other things, like we have a couple of uh, trailer accessories that we need to tow from time to time. Okay. But, uh, so the DPW does a great job when they can get to us when it comes to plowing and sanding. But and for the most part, we've kind of been self-sustainable when it comes to snow removal and things of that nature. Got it. So, But these four are replacing four currently current SUVs. Correct. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, and Scott, maybe we might have to connect and just review that together. Because um, I think in our inventory, I have I have two SUVs, but I do have a, a van, uh, two trucks or a van. So we might just have to make sure. Um, yeah, I thought I might last have to update year, the inventory. I thought last year was supposed to be the truck replacement year, so we yeah. might have we might have pushed that back, Sean. Yeah, I'll make I a note we, just to circle back to. So I have just a question on your experience with the hybrids and longevity. Um, and you said replacing engines. Do these potentially last longer, but you have to replace batteries? So have you had enough of use of them? And then going with sort of Mandy's question of if at 100,000 miles or 105,000 miles, they're not good for chasing down the street as a police vehicle, but they're still in pretty good shape for uh, not high speed driving. Um, could we be thinking of repurposing them when down the road with Crest, which, which they will be having different types of outings? So I, I, I don't know quite how to ask that question. I mean, it, for uh, the usability, we have, we have a hybrid that's well over 100,000 miles and has only needed no engine issues. It just had needed the small battery, not the main battery replaced, so. Yes, yeah, so Kathy, I don't, I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, as far as the sustainability of a hybrid vehicle, you know, we, the ones we've been using have been working really great. Um, they don't, we haven't had a whole lot of engine issues with them. 
it actually seems like the, the gas engines were worst, quite frankly, because when they're idling at a crash scene, for instance, you know, if you're there for an hour, they're obviously not using the gas part of the engine. So they're idling at a very low um, rate, and which is a good thing. And um, so could we possibly pass those on to other departments? We may be able to do that. I just don't know the answer to that yet. Um, Cress, we've been talking about um, with their new vehicle. And as, as Sean mentioned, they're, I think the request was certainly for an electric vehicle. What we're finding is the vehicle they want, which is a small um, four, four passenger van type vehicle in electric is we can't get one. It's just, we've been looking, looking, looking and we're, to order one now we're nine months out. So um, we're figuring we're gonna have to probably get initially a hybrid vehicle for them and then in the following year, get an electric vehicle. I, I see Stephanie has her hand up. She's probably responding to um, link to my question. Stephanie. Hi, thank you, Kathy. Um, yes, I just wanted to um, point out that we do have a green fleets policy in the town. Um, because we're a green community, we had to adopt this green fleets policy. And that requires us when a vehicle um, is being replaced that it can't automatically be passed along unless it meets the green um, green fleets policy fuel efficiency standards. So I can't tell you off the top of my head what all those are. Certainly, hybrid vehicles um, would would certainly fall under that category and could be passed along. But we'd have to make sure um, that if a, a vehicle is is um, is being passed that it meets the uh, fuel efficiency rating that we have in our policy. Otherwise, we could potentially, um, it could potentially negatively impact our green community standing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'm not seeing any other questions um, or hands up. So- All right. Th Thanks so much, Scott. So we can um, wish you happy driving. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Have a good night. So I'm going to bring Jeremiah in. So Jeremiah and Stephanie will um, take on the last department, which is facilities. Um, one thing I'll point out before we dive into facilities. Some people may have done the math. If you add up all of the interior exterior improvement projects and what is in the capital plan, um, they don't equal. And that's because we've asked Jeremiah to try to prioritize those different requests within that number. So um, again, you'll see multiple interior exterior improvement projects um, with different numbers in the, the documentation forms. Um, and those would all sort of be prioritized within the, the allocation that's been established for it. Um, but with that, I will turn it over to Jeremiah. Um, and Jeremiah, when you get to the sustainability one, um, Stephanie's on hand to address that one. Okay. Um, so I, I, is, there, is it possible to uh, um, share my screen? I, I put together just a presentation um, I did last year and it just makes it easy for me to, you know, compose my thoughts. I think you should be able to now. Give it a shot. Jeremiah, you have no arms. Yeah. They're, oh, they're in here somewhere. <laughs> I appreciate the commitment to the virtual background of I think what is town hall. What is, yeah, this yeah. is this was what you would see if you were sitting at my desk. So that's, that's good. I like that. <laughs> okay. Is, I, it, um, I, is it giving you the ability, Jeremiah? Or not not I don't see it. No. So it did expand when I look into the view, but uh, I'm going to make you a host. I think that should give you ability to do that. Actually, um, before you, I'm going to take host back because I don't want you to leave and then exit the meeting. Um, you can just make him co-host with you. Yeah, Sean. I think that gives you the ability to share if you're co-host, right? Yep. Um, 
when you click share at the bottom, it's is it saying that you don't have access or? Let me see here. Okay. Good. Let me move some things around. All right. Can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to run through uh, a lot of the, uh, the items um, that I have going on here. Um, so this is uh, the facilities department's requests. Uh, the first one off is uh, the building automation. So this is an HVAC system upgrade. Uh, so we have a building automated system. This helps us with our HVAC systems. We're able to control and monitor the buildings as far as heat, cooling, ventilation. Uh, in some cases, we can monitor the lighting. Uh, and so we have a system that is, is very antiquated. Um, our, our building automated system uh, is, lives on two servers. So one of those servers is over at APD and the other server is at the North Fire Station. Um, the challenge that we're having now is that the server and the software that's running them is no longer supported. So we have these desktop computers that are running Windows 7. Microsoft isn't supporting Windows 7 at all anymore. So we've, we've, or I shouldn't say we, but the IT department has been so, so great with, with trying to keep these running as long as possible. Um, we've had many, many issues where the system would freeze. And when that system freezes, we really don't have any more control over our HVAC system. So what happens is in those instances is it essentially is just running um, at the exact controls that it was left with. So in most instances, that's probably not a bad thing. But if there, were, there was any drastic changes in temperature, whether they be increase or, or decrease in the environment, I'm not able to make any of those changes. Um, the servers are starting to break down. Um, we've recently, the, the most recent was, I think, like the power system on one. And thankfully, James and IT was able to get the system back running. Um, but the, the amount of work that the IT department has, has done over the years to keep these running has just been tremendous. And uh, it's, it really is time to replace them. So what would we be doing is we'd be eliminating both of those servers. We'd be shifting that, that, all that information over to the, the IT's network, their infrastructure. And then it would go cloud-based. So then we would have the ability to operate our HVAC system off our mobile devices, off our laptops. Uh, so we could be either on premise or, or at our home. So we're able to monitor everything uh, uh, 24 hours a day. So with those upgrades, we also get escalation. So if there was an issue, uh, we would have that sort of notification and escalation. Uh, emails would be sent out saying that this system is offline. Uh, so the, it, it just creates a lot of a lot more flexibility and stability. Uh, and, and it also uh, allows us to upgrade to with BACnet. And BACnet is just sort of has two avenues for the information. One is sending the controls, all the information, and the other is sort of the return. So it, it, that is how modern systems are. So it would allow for this modern, modern uh, um, upgrades for the future. Okay, so the request there is 55,900. And Sean, if you don't mind, I'll just run through each of them and then open it up for questions after. Um, the North Amherst School HVAC system upgrade and the request is for 35,000. Uh, in that image there, you can see our two furnaces over at the North Amherst uh, School. We do have some capital funding uh, currently. It's uh, 25,000 uh, I have in, in funding. And, and the request is to get additional funding so that I can completely eliminate these two uh, natural gas burning, fire, uh, burning furnaces and put in some air, air source heat pump system. Um, that 60,000 won't, won't be able to uh, change over the entire building, but what I'm trying to do is sort of, you know, eat, eat the elephant, 
a byte at a time. So um, this system here is, is, in the, is the most critical. Uh, the furnace on, on your left-hand side is completely decommissioned. Absolutely. And we, we have harvested a, a bunch of the parts in order for the furnace on the right-hand side to run. I did, I did polish them up for you before I took the photo. <laughs> uh, but but uh, th so that is, that is the system. So I really would like to get an air source heat pump system. Uh, for that lower level. Um, most of the lower level is used for town, the town storage. We, we store a lot of our files there. Um, so there's HR, there's legal, there's building inspections, planning. Uh, a number of our, our critical departments are storing their files there. Those are our lo long-term storage. And also we have community action and is in the basement and they uh, have their WIC program down there. So it would, it would help me to eliminate this, these fossil fuel furnaces and uh, go with electrifying uh, this, this section of the building. And Jeremiah is the second story Head Start? The second story is Head Start, yeah. yeah. And they have, the, there's an independent system up there. It's in the attic and that also is natural gas burning. Uh, but that that um, that furnace, it's a horizontal furnace. That one's in in much better condition, and is is running quite well. Um, eventually, that would that will be the ass. So then I would eliminate all the fossil fuels in that building. Um, but to do the entire building would probably be around one hundred and fifty, one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. So. Mm -hmm. Just a little out of time, yeah. But but we the, the the ask is to take care of this, do it in the 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 highest energy efficient, and eliminate fossil fuels without. You, you know, so I'm tr I'm trying to do the be absolute best I can with with what we have in a critical situation. Essentially, Jeremiah, we have a question on do you, do you want to wait till the very end for questions, or do you want to take them as they come? Uh, it's. It's it's up. To, there might be too much if we wait till the end. So I'm okay. happy to answer any questions if we want to do that. Kathy, is it okay if um, yeah. Jennifer goes? Okay. I just have a question for the minutes. What is the name of the community action program that's in the basement? It's the WIC. The WIC. Oh, a WIC. Gotcha. Yes. Um, and sorry. And as long as I have the floor, what is the North Amherst School? I feel like I should know that, but I don't know what that building is. It's it's right across from the library. Do you know where the North Amherst Library is? There's an old school right across the street. Oh, gotcha. Red brick. Yeah. Anna. Uh, Jennifer, I had the same question when they came before CPA last year. I was like, feels like, do we have another school that I had no idea existed? Um, so my question is about the first one. Sorry, I'm going to back us up a little bit. And, and it might be for you, Jeremiah, but it might be for Stephanie. In the application, it said, you know, there's the potential for grants and utility subsidies for this type of thing. Um, I'm just curious what the capacity of our staff is to seek those grants out, if that's a realistic thing that we can look for or not for that project. I don't know who wants to take that, but I'm gonna just- Well, we've, we've already, we, uh, and I, I've already been exploring so, some of this, and this is something that I've brought to Sean too, and even through the, uh, the CARES funding and some of the other uh, federal uh, programs, we've we've been in trying to get some some of this funded through through those. Um, I, I think Stephanie would be much better at answering whether or not um, some of those are through the avenues that she typically um, uh, looks at uh, finding the, these funding from. There's there's always. Um, Eversource and, and Berkshire Gas that 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 do help with these, but since it's controls, it's a little bit more challenging. They want to see equipment be replaced, um, I, and I don't know that I don't know that they all everyone always sees the benefit of of the the control side of it. There's there's so much efficiency that can be built within systems just on the controls, um, where even if you were burning, you know, number six oil that you just with your controls alone that you can you can create a more efficient building and a more efficient equipment yeah so. i'll I'm, i'd love to hear stephanie's thoughts on this and then i also have a follow-up on that if it's okay 
Um, sure. Uh, well, I was just going to say that um, for this type of funding, we typically go through our green communities grant for efficiencies. Um, and the problem is that the North Amher school is actually not on our baseline inventory. Um, and I know there was a decision process that we had way back in 2012 when we put it together, but I honestly can't recall why we didn't have that particular building included. Um, but uh, so, th so that this funding would be really important because we can't use that grant source for that project. Um, we can use it for others, but we can't, uh, we can't use it for a North Amherst school. So, but the other projects in other buildings, we absolutely um, and have applied for green communities funding. The problem is sometimes the timing. The timing doesn't always work. When you need to, you know, when Jeremiah needs to address some right. failing system, the timing doesn't always work with the grant funding where it just magically aligns. So we do have to try to, as much as we can, plan ahead. Um, and we do have a grant cycle coming up. Uh, I think we're gonna be looking to the fall uh, for an, a next application. And we will be looking at some of these projects, but sometimes even with the funding that we have, it's not always enough. And so, um, you know, we can we can look to the grant funding to help supplement some of that if the timing is right. So, and Stephanie, you kind of are getting at my second question. Wait, so just to clarify that the one that's on the screen now, this one would not be a potential grant a North Hammer school project no, the, would be. This one's APD no, and North Fire. Sorry, I, I can't, I'm on no, my you're phone. Fine. Oh, so no worries. Apologize. So this is the HVAC system upgrade um, um, for the that, servers. That potentially could be, potentially. So each year, Green Communities adjusts what they will and will not fund, and it's not consistent every year. So um, I think I noticed that HVA systems, HVAC systems can be, uh, funded through the program. Like for instance, lighting was historically always um, uh, covered under the Green Communities Program. They've discontinued that funding now. So, you know, so there's no more LED lighting retrofits unless it's schools. Um, so, you know, I, I think I believe that they may, but again, the timing has to work because we would apply in the fall but that doesn't mean by the time you actually get the grant, it might not actually be until, you know, 23, well into 23 that we actually get the funding. So then Sean, my other question, thank you, Stephanie. Um, that welcome. was really helpful. So then Sean, my other question is, when we're asking this question about are there grants available? Mm -hmm. Is it, I mean, is it hypothetical? Like, are we expecting folks to apply for grants and then reimburse for money that the grant they get from a grant, like how does that, and this is kind of more of a process question, how does that work with the grant funding? Yeah, I mean, we ask that question because it gets asked here a lot. Um, so we want, we want department heads thinking about it as they're preparing the request for the following year um, uh, to at least consider it if there are grants. Um, I think if, if, they, if there was a grant available for this and this project was approved and then a grant became available, um, yeah, we'd have to, it would depend on the grant, whether or not we could just say, we're not going to use the, the capital article and we, we would move forward with the grant. Um, sometimes there's, there's issues around supplanting and things like that. If there's um, local funds that have been earmarked for it and then a grant comes in. So I guess before we do allocate funds, we do want to be careful. Uh, um, we want to sort of commit to it, I think at that point. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and real quickly, uh, just to speak on, on that uh, a little bit more, Anna is is with most of this these equipment uh, when you're when you're looking for when I'm looking for uh, incentives, I, I'm typically having to do uh, sometimes engineering studies or or energy audits, and that all happens. It's it's like I'm calling people up and saying, "Hey, I have this great idea. I want to replace you know X Y Z equipment." is there any money out there for me? And, and they, they really like to be in that, at that stage of the project. Mm -hmm. So then they'll come out and have a look at everything. And then they start to, see, to, to start figuring out, is there money out there for this project? Are there incentives from, from our utility companies or are there other opportunities like green communities? And, and then that's when you sort of build into it. So 
it, it's tough. We, you look at um, even say mass save for, for commercial and business. They'll have language in there that says, well, we will do weatherization and we'll do insulation. But then as, as Stephanie could tell you, some of those items on there are extremely difficult to get any incentivization for or any money for. You just want to be like, well, why do you have it listed then? <laughs> you know, it's, it's yeah. there. That means I want to, I want to try to, you know, use that, that an opportunity, but it's challenging. There's stuff for controls, but it's just, it's a difficult one to get money for, unfortunately. Well, that's, I, I, yeah, I don't want to force you like to, you know, to say yeah. you're going to grant fund something when we don't know if that is yeah. reality. So we, I get that. Thank do. you. I, I, ha I usually, you have to bring them in as early as possible to hopefully get any incentives or any money. And, and really, I think sometimes it does build, but they are there before you, you allocate or you start spending any of the money. And the last thing Anna, I'll just add is sometimes for these types of projects are rebates. Um, you know, a little bit different than a grant where we could offset the cost of the project if, um, you know, if it qualifies for some type of rebate through the utility or um, some other program. Uh, question, um, are these two programs, the major ones in there, are they under some kind of lease arrangement? And if so, uh, what is the length of their lease? No, they're not there it's 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 our essentially our equipment at this point so no, no i'm talking about the programs i yes the yeah the ser the servers no no the no you're the, doing the, people, the renters you're doing, you're doing um, the school oh, oh yes i yeah. my apologies right north Amherst school that's, a, that's the topic we were on yes all right. Yes, it, it is a uh, it is a lease agreement. I don't know what the terms of that. Maybe Sean Sean. Knows. I don't have it off the top of my head. We'd have to um, pull it up. But they but they have been renting the the space for quite some time. Yeah. Right. You know, and the only reason I'm asking that question you're you're going to make a capital investment, and it would be good to know uh, how long these programs are committed to be there, i.e., uh, the Head Start program and the Community Action program. I mean, if they were up, if you go ahead and when this money is allocated and their lease is up next year and they go somewhere else, then then where are we? So it'd be good to know that, be, you know, in my mind, uh, that this the lease arrangements are really uh, something I think is really critical to know in relationship to our uh, then going on and approving funding for this. So um, I'm not seeing any other hands. I have still on the North Hammer School, and I know you, you've got the North Hammer School um, later on the hot water heater. Yes. Um, I have a question just on the price tags on these. Um, for uh, the air source heat pump, we've installed them in our house, and then we have friends. And these the, the compressors can do one room pretty well, and they're not at this kind of price tag. So I don't know whether you're looking at a different kind of technology, um, because the other question is, uh, people I know whose house, they did a larger commercial, and there's an apparatus in the downstairs room and an upstairs room just on the two um, that, that, that does a, a good job air conditioning as well as heating. So I, I just wondered if this is a different level of air source heat pump that costs this much money. So let me ask you that one. And then my second one is on the price tag for the hot water heater in the North Amherst School. To my knowledge, there are only bathrooms there. There's no showers. So why, why we wouldn't look at on-demand apparatuses just to heat the water as it comes into the sink, just not do a hot water heater at all. And when I looked at, I did a quick look at the prices. Those are in the 180 to $250 range. You know, so you're just attaching them on the wall right next to the sink and it heats the water. So a less expensive way of making sure that the sink in the bathroom has hot water, which I think is the, I don't, I don't think there's a kitchen in there. You may know more about it, but I think, I know there are bathrooms. I've been in the building. Um, so it's the, the two questions were both about the prices. Um, yeah, so the uh, the air source heat pumps that would go into North Amherst 
are, it could be a, a Dakin system or say a Mitsubishi. And what would, we, what would we be looking at is putting in a commercial grade hyperheat system. So the hyperheats are, are able to not only, you're, you're, you're heating the, the space, you're also getting the air conditioning. They're able to, they have a larger capacity at a cooler temperature. So once, once those temperatures start drop, getting close to, to fr the freezing point, the efficiency of those, those compressors, the efficiency that they have to extract heat out of the air declines. So when we're at say 30 degrees outside, you may only be able to, to achieve 60 degrees in your home, depending on how the system is built. So with the hyperheats, we're able to go a lot lower. I believe those ones are negative five before they start to struggle. And, and that, that is, that's gonna absolutely happen in New England. So my concern is, is if we have, my, my concern is less for the storage areas, if that was 60 degrees, but if we're starting to consider the areas like uh, the WIC offices or the Head, the Head Start program, 60 degrees is, is, will not do. Uh, we, need, we need to main, maintain minim, minimum temperatures. Other, another nice feature with the hyperheat systems or even the, uh, the, the Dakin systems is you can pipe uh, energy recovery ventilation systems directly into them. So in a lot of the air source heat pumps, you have your cassette on the wall and you have your compressor outside. There's no real ventilation that's happening. They're essentially taking your, the air that's within the room and recycling it through the coil. Uh, with these better systems, we're able to pipe in fresh air from the outside. So now we have our air exchanges and we have this, this great technology uh, that's heating and cooling the spaces. It, uh, unfortunately, they are the, those compressors, the cassettes and what you see inside the, the, how, the, the homes or the buildings aren't much different. So what you may have at, at your home is not a lot different than you would see at North Amherst. It's the compressors outside that, that are a bit different. They look very similar, uh, but the technology that they have is, is, just, is just a lot better. It really is. And then bathrooms, the, the hot water heater in the North Amherst School. The, I know hot, I'm just yeah, focused. so I, I, have, I have a picture of this, you know, wonderful uh, heat pump hot water heater uh, for the two bigger systems, but I agree with you. So the, the, the North Amherst School, if it was going to be a tank system, it would be a hybrid system. So it'd still be an electric heat pumped uh, tank system. But, but I agree, there's, there's, there's not a constant demand and an on-demand uh, heater would do just fine. I, I was even trying to figure out if I could do on-demand at the Amherst Police Department as well as North, North Fire Station. And I'm just not sure I could. I might be able to, but what it would be is you would walk into it, you're not gonna see one box on the wall. There would be a bank of probably six of them and at that point, it, am I doing, you know, the, the building a disservice and am I achieving the efficiencies that I want? Okay. It may not be when you have six units really burning up some, some uh, kilowatts because they, yeah, they, I, they take quite a bit. Yeah, my question was less about them because I know they have to take showers and that yeah. they do. Um, so they have a bigger draw. Um, they're probably yeah. they may even they may even wash clothes. You know, have laundry. Whereas the North Amherst School doesn't have that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's there's two hot water tanks in there. One of them supplies hot water to the WIC office, and the other one the, the gas the natural gas supplies to Head Start. So up in Head Start, we have each classroom has a sink. One of the classrooms has two. And then we have a, um, I will call it like an office teacher's lounge area. And that's like a kind of kitchenette. So there is a dishwasher and a sink there. So I would say we probably have about, and, and as well as the restroom and a slop sink. <laughs> Just keep adding. So we're, we probably had around eight sinks and a dishwasher. Could we still size an on-demand system for that? Absolutely, because it doesn't have the same uh, a, a constant 
or gallons per hour that say a shower, shower would need or filling up a bathtub, it's just sinks. Um, so, so the gallons per hour uh, for heating is still relatively low. And that's absolutely something that I would look into. Okay, thank you. So I know I jumped ahead. You didn't get to that picture yet. So sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Else. And here we are. <laughs> so the Amherst Fire North Amherst School and Kathy, Kings I just just be. I didn't want to. I don't want to cut you off, Jeremiah. But Irv has his hand up. I didn't. Oh, know. I, I didn't know whether Irv's hand. Okay, Irv. Sorry. I thought maybe okay. it's here. All right, he put it down. Maybe it's. Um, it should have been lowered. Uh, so the, here's the hot water, uh, hot water heater replacements for uh, the North Fire Station, North Amherst School and Police Department departments. So both of those systems, uh, uh, or all three buildings have natural gas tanked hot water uh, heat, heating systems. Over at North Fire Station, we have a small uh, A.O. Smith uh, heater, it, it, I believe that that boiler has a 100 gallon capacity, and then it has a, a tank, which is a 200 gallon capacity tank. So you have this, this heater that's trying to heat not only what's in the boiler itself, but also this large storage tank uh, before it goes up into the field or into the building. The police department has uh, one sort of packaged unit, it's 120 gallon or 120 gallon tank. Uh, that one has had a tank replacement back in 2013, but the burner assembly is in, in, in the pumps are still, uh, they're older. I don't know if they're original, they're not likely. Um, but th both of those ones are sh absolutely showing their wear. They're really, they're showing some sig significant deterioration Especially, I would say the police department, the burner, uh, you can see it uh, in the photos. Um, and when I, when I go to the current conditions, you'll be able to see some of the issues um, that I have there. So the intent would be to replace both of the bigger systems with an, an air, it's a, um, an electric heat pump uh, system. So in this image, you can see it's a lock and bar. A.O. Smith has essentially the same system. These are able to run on air source heat pump, on full electric or a hybrid. So it has those three mo modes to it. This particular unit has 120 gallon uh, tank on it, and it's able to meet the, the demands that both of those buildings have. So the current hot water boilers, uh, push out about 150 gallons, or it has a, the first hour of 150 gallons. Um, and this system is able to do that as well, but with incredible efficiency. And it's, it's electrified. Um, this, this particular unit is probably one of the nicest that I've seen. They do have some hybrid systems, but the hybrid systems aren't able to meet the demands that either of the buildings um, uh, need. Um, and like I had mentioned earlier, I was looking at on-demand systems with booster pumps, uh, but to, it was the largest commercial on-demand uh, hot water heater. I, I estimated needing about six of them to take care of the police department. So not, not only do you have these six, six units that are, that are trying to meet the demand, it's also, I, you have to consider the footprint of this. I'm going from a tank that's about 28 inches around and, and sitting in the corner to now, now needing three feet on either side of this bank. And so I would be looking at probably eight feet by 12 foot of space. Uh, and where do I put that? You know, so it's, it, I'm trying to, trying to sort of work it from, you know, di different ways. Um, so the next slide shows us all the way to the left is the North Fire Station's uh, hot water boiler and their tank. Um, we, you can see that we, we, we did try to create some efficiency with, uh, our fiberglass insulation, uh, because those tanks 
typically don't have much insulation, if any at all. That boiler is starting to fail. Um, and and it, so it's it's been a concern. We had uh, two of the hot water boilers that are used for heating replaced over at North Fire. And while there, our uh, industry professionals were looking at that, that boiler saying, it's time to consider uh, getting rid of it because it's starting to fail. I have a lot of experience with those, those particular types of boilers and, and they do, they just, they just, what happens is, is it has a large finned worm inside and that's where it holds all, all of the water. Eventually they become so encrusted with soot that, that you, you, don't have, you no longer have a good heat exchange. So most of that combustion gas, most of that heat is just going right up your stack. You're, you have, it's very inefficient. You're not heating the water. And what tends to happen is the metals inside of there start to actually uh, crumble, almost like potato chips, because they can't take that, that amount of heat. Uh, and it, it essentially falls apart from the inside out. There's, there's no way to really get to that. You would have to completely strip that and acid bath it in order to, uh, to fully clean it. Uh, the middle picture is the, the hot water heater over at the APD. If you look at the bottom of the photo, if you see that sort of rusty color there, that's actually coming from the burner. So that's another area that we're, we're seeing this, the inside of the boilers uh, deteriorating. So oftentimes we'll sweep out or vacuum up some of that, that metal that is, that is shaling off. That's, it's, the inside is, it, again, it's effervescing. I know I use that word, but it's it, these small flakes peeling off the inside and it makes everything inside weaker and weaker. And it's just sort of falling out. Eventually you'll have ca catastrophic failure where water will just dump out the bottom of it. Jeremiah, I don't want to rush you, but I, I just want to make sure we get through the um, yeah. get through the uh, remainder of the facility projects. And the last one is the North Amherst um, Schools heat heater. So again, just just kind of gives you a sense. Uh, you know, that was a close up. That picture was more for me, so I could see all the the in information on it. Okay. So all buildings, interior and exterior improvements. Uh, the request is for one hundred and five thousand dollars and this is for uh, general ongoing repairs across all town buildings just ensuring that the buildings are adequately maintained um, and with this money um, always looking at ways to uh, uh, save energy reduce our carbon footprint and also uh, correct some of our accessibility uh, challenges that we have across all these buildings so in this photo, you can see that we have some deterioration of the curbing, which is impacting our handrails. So the money would go to fixing up all these, we'll say smaller projects. This wouldn't go to one large project, but a lot of these smaller issues. Yeah, we have a photo of some more masonry that's deteriorating uh, on the right hand side. Uh, this is just shown to so you can see the glazing around the bottom of that column is separated and that's where water uh, is able to creep in and start causing damage to, to the concrete, the, the metal infrastructure, and then it just, it gets inside the building causing even more issues. Um, over on the left, we have the exterior lighting on bangs. These are older T8s, has four lamps in them. You know, the, I, I want to, I would love to get rid of get rid of all of those and put some um, LED light fixtures out there. I think that there's a dozen of those. I'm sure that I can reduce the, 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 the wattage by probably two thirds uh, on the exterior banks while giving more light. The center image is to illustrate the need for water fill stations. We have a lot of these uh, kind of traditional style water bubblers across the town buildings, uh, but there is just, you know, every day there's a more demand for filling up our, our, our bottles that we bring with us to work. So either replacing these units or 
putting in a kit that that transforms them from this traditional style to a bottle fill station. And on the right hand side, I just included an image where the, the door, these are heavy wooden doors in our buildings and some of them are showing this cracking. So this is trying to repair them. If not, we're replacing them. And, and you know, obviously the replacement is, is not somewhere where we wanna be, but, but all of these things is, are some smaller or bigger issues that, that we come across that we need to, to fix. If you want, Sean, I'll just kind of burn through them and just leave it up for a question. North Fire Station sprinkler system, the request is for $36,000. So over at North Fire Station, we have a fire suppression system, but currently that fire suppression system is only on the first floor of the building and the apparatus bay. So the money is to go to expand that fire suppression system up into the second floor. The second floor of the building is where our student force and our career force have their sleeping quarters. This is, it, it, it's it critical that we, we get our, our fire suppression system up there. Uh, we have individuals sleeping there. They're, this is their second home. This is their home away from home. When they're here helping our community and keeping it safe. So I think it's important that we keep them safe and have that sprinkler system installed up there. Once that sprinkler is on the second floor, that an entire building will be fully sprinkled. And I think that's where we need to be. We're not only in this building, but in a lot of our buildings. And just adding to that, this is, um, we're making a big investment in the central fire station. So this fire station's likely gonna be with us for a while. Okay, North Fire Station. Another one for the North Fire Station is, is the exterior siding. So in this image, you can see that this wooden facade. So we have this building that's mostly concrete or block, but we also have this wooden facade on the building. And, and that, that is original to the 1974. It's a marine grade plywood. Um, over the years, it's been maintained, it's been primed, it's been painted, uh, but we're just at the point where there's, there's the wood is decayed uh, and that's really due to the weather and the UV exposure that it gets. Uh, this side of the building is the south side facing uh, uh, building. So it's highly visible and it also just receives a lot of sun. Um, so the, the request would be to cover, either remove and replace or just cover up this wood uh, with a much more durable, low, low maintenance uh, uh, siding option. Um, I'd like to see some type of commercial metal siding on there, uh, but there's also fiber cement and, and vinyl siding. And obviously something like this would go through design review board and, and but I'm trying to get some, some, some things or some ideas to be able to uh, present to, to that committee. Uh, it's, it's just needed. I, I think um, with North Fire Station, um, it, it, I, I don't want to say it's an eyesore, but we, we can certainly make it look a lot better than that. Um, so I, the request is to, to get that sided. The soffit underneath is also wooden, but it's in much better condition. Okay, and I have a couple more examples. You can see some of the damage. Um, so everywhere there's wood, we're, we have the same, same issue. Okay. Uh, next is a port portable assistive listening systems and the request is for $93,142. And the, the purpose of this request is to purchase two portable assisted lis listening systems. Uh, the, the request is to provide assisted li listening systems to all town meeting rooms as it is recommended in our recently updated ADA 504 self-evaluation and transition plan. Uh, and it's also been expressed, it's been an express need identified by residents uh, who are in our el elderly population and persons with disabilities. Uh, so uh, working with the, the senior center directors or past senior center directors and a lot of the individuals who uh, uh, utilize the senior center there's, there's been a lot of uh, uh, concern and um, uh, suggestions that, that it would help out uh, quite a bit. So these two systems, one being much larger, 
uh, would it also be able to, to support the town council if they were to meet at Bangs. And I know in, in some at some point in the town council's histories that we did have to meet over in the large activity of town, uh, the bank center. And this would allow us to be able to do that. Um, and then there's a smaller one. So both of these systems are portable. Um, it doesn't put a system in every single room per se. It's not a permanent system, but it, it's two portable systems that, that could be used in any meeting space in, in the town. It's also the same system that we have in a town room. So if we were ever in need and we just needed some more microphones or some more uh, receivers, uh, we could always bring them from those systems over to the town room and expand our system. So it, it allows us that flexibility to grow our system or shrink it. Um, this, these systems also include a speaker. Um, so you have, the, they're, they're completely self-contained. So it has all the amplification, has all the receivers, has the speaker systems, has all the microphones and has all these receivers that they're the wearables, we'll say. And I'll just add that this one, um, there was a recommendation from the Disability Access Advisory Committee. I don't know if everybody saw that, but um, for this, there was a recommendation from them for that project. Yeah. And uh, we have Amherst Police Department exterior maintenance and the request is for $100,000. Uh, and this is similar to the, the other, the all buildings and it is to, uh, uh, for general and ongoing exterior repairs needed for the Amherst Police Department to ensure the, the facility is adequately maintained. A lot of the same stuff that was mentioned in the all buildings is there are particulars here. So uh, in this image of the APD is the back door and the, the associated windows. As you can see, the gasketing for that window is, is has failed and we have moisture at, uh, that's in between the panes of glass. So now we've reduced our, our, our value, we've reduced our efficiency, uh, and that is something that, that would need to be replaced. And that's just one, of, one example. Um, over on the left-hand side, you can see a small concrete uh, landing and then the walkway beyond. So every, every exit, that emergency exit out of a building should have a, a hard surface. So the code says that you must exit out of a building onto a hard surface. Well, we do have a landing, but it doesn't meet a public right of way. So part of that money would be to ensure that we have a sidewalk, ensure that we have this hard surface uh, that meets the public right of way. So expanding that sidewalk over to that door. There's another one at the front of the building. It, that one's gonna be a little bit more tricky just for aesthetics. But again, looking at these, these are, these are life safety measures that should be put in place uh, and that's to expand that sidewalk. Uh, the middle image is, is a, a, and it, it, it's a picture of the underside of the, the fascia and the soffit of, of the, the police department. You can't really see it in this image, but there's a lot of areas around the perimeter of the building that we have some, uh, uh, Essentially, we have some breaches in that. So there could be weather. Uh, we could we see sunlight, uh, and there has been times where we've had um, unwelcome guests come in through there. At that corner, at that point, is probably the thinnest point of the building. The thinnest part of that building is where that roof structure and that soffits meet. Uh, so working with the town. Um, in tree and grounds, they've been able to trim back some of the branches. Uh, so that helps keep those unwanted guests out. Uh, but, but really doing a comprehensive look at the perimeter and making those necessary repairs. Um, on the right hand side, there's a, a catch basin, a drain right outside or right in front of the Sally port. It's kind of hard to tell but that area that's patched in and you can see where the, the soil has, has sort of filled up, that, that, has, that catch basin has significantly dropped. And, and that needs to be raised and reworked. So there is work that's needed on our driveway 
in, in parking area at APD. So it's just, just illustrating some of the, the needs around the building. And that is it. I stopped sharing. I hope that's okay. Jeremiah, can I just, um, so there's two other projects. Um, one is Stephanie's um, energy sustainability improvements, but um, the other bucket that's in that we added was um, some of the repointing projects that you, um, yes. we took them off individually and put them, can you just talk about the re repointing a little bit? Yeah, so we, the, the buildings, are, uh, we have a lot of older buildings and, and some of our, even the newer buildings like APD, we have 1996 and then we have the town hall that's what, 1890s? So all these buildings, you have this wonderful brick on the outside of the building. If we don't do, over time, that masonry in between the bricks will start to deteriorate. And that's either through weather or sometimes it's growth. So sometimes we get vegetation that'll get in there and start pushing out that repointing. Repointing is something that we have to do with all any brick building, any masonry building, um, across town. And that's really to help ensure that you don't have uh, water penetrating into the building. Once you get water penetration in, there's obviously huge uh, uh, issues that it does cause. So there's, there's a scale that happens inside buildings, the, the sheetrock, the, the wooden structure starts to, starts to break down. So it's really, it's very uh, um, important that we take care of that envelope because really that envelope of the building takes it will will protect everything inside so good good roof good solid walls and a good foundation everything else in, inside is, is in good shape so um, that money will help us to repoint all of our brick buildings so you, you, it's it it will be an ask in future years absolutely it has to be uh, but that money will help take care of the air areas that, that is a critical need um, and start cleaning those up so we can eliminate some of our water pe penetration issues. And then I guess the last one is, um, Stephanie, do you wanna speak to the energy sustainability improvement uh, project? Sure. Um, so the $200,000 that were, that was being requested for sustainability um, Really, I think both Jeremiah and um, Scott Livingstone were great um, introductions to the need for things like technology that can be retrofitted onto um, either existing vehicles, existing buildings uh, to sort of help with efficiency measures. One of the things we need with buildings are, as Jeremiah pointed out earlier, our engineering studies. So for instance, if you, we want to go for Green Communities grant funding, we're going to need an engineering study um, to uh, actually lay out what, it, what the needs are, the efficiency needs are, uh, or improvements would be for that building. So if we look at this year as an example, the $100,000 that we received uh, for funding this year, $25,000 of that is going towards um, idling, anti-idling technology for the new fire pump truck. Um, so we're looking to, uh, to supply that vehicle with this efficiency that otherwise we wouldn't have the funding for. Um, and then the $75,000 that we have is actually going towards the solar uh, assessment that's being done that will be used to help guide development of the solar bylaw for the town. So these things come up quite frequently. Um, there's sometimes the inability to have these studies done can be barriers towards getting funding. So even though it feels like it's yet another study, it's actually the study that will help us get the funding to do the project. So um, I don't wanna, it's, I think you've probably gone later than you anticipated. So I'll stop right there. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer. And I'll just quickly add to what Stephanie said, which is um, there's a lot of, energy money coming out later this year. Um, some of the, the law, um, the funding programs have been passed by um, the president, have a, a lot of money for towns, uh, for local governments and for schools. Um, 
And so there's a lot of uh, activity on our side to try to have plans ready so that we have um, sort of developed projects that we can apply for. Um, our legislators have told us the same thing. There, um, uh, Marky had a had a um, presentation a week ago or two weeks ago, kind of saying the same thing to people, which is get ready, um, especially like on electric school buses and um, charging infrastructure and things like that. Um, so we are trying to ramp up this funding and try to make sure we have projects that are ready to go that we could apply for some of these um, larger grants. So any questions, um, real, re recognizing that it's a late hour, um, Anna. I, it's quick, I promise. I, I watched everyone's face go, oh no. Um, okay, so my question, Jeremiah, is looking at the uh, looking at the document that talks about status of approved projects in the past, the police department still has a little over $25,000 left for exterior maintenance, according to that document. Is that factored into the estimate that you gave for exterior maintenance, or is that, how, how do those play together? So that that money, um, it, that is older older money. I believe that's from eighteen. Uh, it might be. Yeah, it's eighteen. Um, yeah. So what I'm I have been using that money for is in that same year, it was approved. There was approved for interior maintenance. Um, so with this request for exterior maintenance, I've been using some of that money that 25,000 for interior maintenance work. Um, because we, we also have uh, a number of plumbing issues that I'm trying to correct right now, um, it, it particularly in the, the men's and women's locker rooms um, be, between the, the, the fixtures, but also the countertops. Um, a, a lot of those uh, areas uh, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing the age. So we're seeing that, in, you know, 1996, the counters are swollen, um, the faucets are leaking. So it's, there's, I'm using that as, as a, a way to correct some of these uh, interior issues, as well as taking care of some of the exterior. So the, it, to answer you, yes, it is factored in. But at the same time, I would say that most of that money would go to interior issues. So, so I have one of Stephanie um, about the sustainability fund that we that was first last year. One of the resident requests was from two high school students to look at solar canopies over the high school parking lot, parking lots, but look more broadly, and we sort of folded it into the larger sustainability fund saying it could be used for that. Are there plans to, as and, and that it was a similar idea of be ready in case money becomes available, but that we would have to say, where could these go? How many of these could go? Is that still in the works? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, okay. um, there's actually a, um, we received Meta Grant funding uh, through the state and that was actually identified as part of that project. Um, there is additional, there are additional funds, I believe, that are being used on top of the, the Meta Grant funds. Sean can speak to that. Um, but, yeah. but that is being addressed in, yeah, in at least just, one of our projects. So we, um, we partnered with the region who got a earmark um, from the state, I think it was fifteen thousand dollar earmark from the state to um, specifically study study solar canopies at the right. high school and middle school, um, and we partnered. We added that to what we were looking for, which is basically everywhere else or uh, uh, many other places that are municipal buildings, both um, canopies and storage. Um, so we put that all together in one scope, and we um, we had our kickoff meeting with the schools and and the the consultant the other day. Um, and we are looking at ways to incorporate the, um, the students who were the requesters for that project. So um, we're thinking about ways to engage them in the meetings with, um, with the vendor who's gonna be doing this analysis. Um, and at the end, we're, we should have a report by the end of June, I think um, Stephanie, right? That will give us mm -hmm. the information that we're seeking about um, what it would cost to do it at these buildings, what it would look like, you know, how ready are, are they for it? Um, you know, where do they recommend we start? Where, where does it make the most sense, that kind of thing. 
That's great. Thank you. You know, the, for those of you who weren't here last year, we had passionate students who were hoping this would happen before they graduated. So it's, a, you know, and, and they saw it as a beginning. They understood it wouldn't result in canopies, but it would be uh, seed money that could do it long term. That's that's terrific to hear. Um, so I'm any other questions or comments and I'm looking at public and I think we have one person in the public Dave Zomack so I'm not sure if there are public comments but I don't want to open it up for public till I make sure um, there aren't any closing comments or questions from the committee I'm not seeing any and so are there any comments from the public if so raise your hand not seeing any. So I think we are then done with a pretty ambitious agenda. Um, one request I would have, Jeremy, is that you send your chart pack to Sean, because we can then post it as part of this meeting packet. And then the minutes will show that we viewed a series of pictures, but Jennifer doesn't have to capture all the words because you've given us the words in the minutes. Um, so we can post it. That, that was very helpful, I thought, to have. Um, and your passion is clearly right up there with keeping us in good shape. <laughs> Thank you. So I think um, I can say we're adjourned. And then next week, remind us. Six, Sean, 630 again next week. So we are um, meeting again. Again, it's this the changed hour for next week. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Uh, Mandy has her hand up. CRC has decided to cancel its meeting next week. Um, because there aren't agenda items. So if the committee would, if this committee would prefer to meet at the previously scheduled five to seven, I do not have a conflict anymore. Is that a, it looks like several thumbs up. So we're shifting back to five o'clock for next week. That would be great. Let me, I, I think that um, is okay if I just confirm with the department heads that were coming. Um, oh, okay. Because oh, I right. had originally given them the 630 okay. time, but I'm sure yeah. they'll be fine moving it earlier, but just let me um, double check. Great, great okay. Session. So you get back to us. Thank you very much. So I think did, that what what did Irv say about whether that creates a problem for him? Yeah, it, it's I, I know that a lot of people may have thick schedules, but I am on several com, several committees and boards, and uh, changing back and forth like this is wreaking havoc with my schedule. If we're going to do it at five o'clock, that's fine. But if we're going to switch back. If it's going to six thirty, that's fine. But switching back that hour, believe it or not, makes a big difference to me. Okay. So I think we're leaving it that Sean will see if we can switch. And were these the only two that were switched to the later hour? Um, there was one more on March 17th. And then the rest of them would all be at 5 o'clock, 5 to 7. But okay. Kathy, maybe you and I can connect offline. Okay, so we'll, um, we'll just connect because we're trying not to back and forth, but we right. um, appreciate um, you raising that earth. So I think then we are adjourned and Sean will get back to us as quickly as possible so we can figure out what our calendar for next week looks like. Thank you everyone and have yeah. a good night. We're adjourned. <laughs>